dual plenary session, managing in a low price environment. I'm Bob Tippy, I'm editor of Oil and Gas Journal. Uh, and as you all know, we are in the middle of an unprecedented contraction of the oil and gas business. Unprecedented in uh, uh, upstream spending, uh, according to the International Energy Agency. And I would suggest that it's unprecedented in another couple of ways. Uh, I, know I don't have any metrics to support this. As this is just observations of somebody who's written about the oil and gas business for almost 40, 40 years for the oil and gas journal. Uh, I, I've written through several of these downturns. I have never seen a response so prompt and so uniform as I experienced when uh, crude prices started to, to, to decline in 2014. The companies cut spending uh, and they added an almost programmatic dimension to the contraction. They said, I remember several, several of the companies said, if, if the crude price goes below $50 a barrel, we'll cut some more. And it did and they did. And that was just in 2015. They cut again in, in 2016. Uh, I would say that we've had a structural response to what I believe is a structural change uh, in the oil market and the industry will be different on account of it. Uh, certainly right now the focus is on cost. Uh, I'll let the, uh, the, the, the speakers um, uh, address that. That's what you're here to, to, to speak about and that's what they are uh, well positioned uh, to address. Um, a little about how the, the session will go. Um, I'll introduce the first speaker. Uh, he'll, he'll speak and then I'll introduce the second. I'll introduce them all at once. Uh, when all three are, are, are finished, we'll, we'll have questions. Uh, we'll ask ourselves some questions up here first, and then we'll open the questions to you. We should have lots of time uh, for questions. Uh, so please be thinking about your questions, jot them down. Uh, if you do have a question, there's a, there's a hand mic right down here in the, in, the, in, in the front row. You can make your way over there so you can get, that, get the hand mic, and you know, if it works out that you can hand it across to people, that's, that, that's fine. Uh, we, we can be we can be as informal uh, as, as you would like to be. Um, with that, we introduce our, our first speaker. David E. Chenier is Chief Procurement Officer for ConocoPhillips. He entered the industry with BP America in 1985 and joined ConocoPhillips in 1990. He's worked in the United States, Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Before moving back to the U.S. to become general manager of contract sourcing, sourcing and supplier management, Chenier was president of the United Kingdom. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Petroleum Engineering from Louisiana State University and a Master's degree in Business Administration from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Please welcome David E. Chenier. Good afternoon. I'm kind of at a little bit of a disadvantage because usually I like to come to these things before I speak and get a sense of the mood of the place, whereas this time I flew in this morning, so I haven't had a chance to mingle. So just to kind of help me calibrate my uh, uh, comments, and I want to have a bunch of comments, I'll, I'll, I'll go pretty quickly through them so you have time for Q&A. I just want to get a sense from you guys as to just what your view is of the all price outlook. So I'm going to ask you kind of one of three options. You know, one is prices are about where they're going to be, you know, kind of plus or minus 10%. Prices are going to be much lower. Prices will be much higher, say, in the next couple of years. So just those that think prices are about where they're going to be, plus or minus 10% for the next couple of years, raise your hand. Well, that's a lot to the about 50% or so. Uh, how many people see prices going much lower? Not, almost no one. And then higher? Okay. So about... It wasn't very scientific, but it looked like the bulk of people think prices are about where they're going to be for the next couple of years, plus or minus 10%. No one saw prices going lower, and no one saw prices going higher. So I just wanted to get kind of the mood of the room, because I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, managing in a low-price environment, and you'll probably get three messages from me. Really, one is uh, that you need to be humble, because no one can really predict prices, uh, and I'll show you that. I'm sure you guys are aware of that. The next one's going to be because you can't predict product prices, you need to be cautious, which usually means be quite conservative in your price outlooks when you're planning your business. And then the last one, probably the most important one for the theme of this talk, and that's really need to be transformative when it comes to the things that you can control. So when you're doing your own business planning, 
you really, you know, the old saying that never waste a crisis really does apply right now. If you view prices or or are in a crisis mode, yes, there's some negative aspects to that, but it is a golden opportunity not to waste a crisis. So you'll, you'll, you'll see some of that in my talk, and we can touch on it in the Q&A as well. So first, let's talk about being humble. And I, I don't know if you guys recall this, but I'm, I'm older than a lot of people in the room. So because I came out of university in 85, prices were already pretty bad. And a lot of my career uh, was watching prices stay at a relatively low uh, price for a very, very long time. And I thought it was interesting to look at when did we last think prices were going to head lower. And it actually was in 1999, about the time that this uh, cover came out in The Economist, saying that we're drowning in oil. And a lot of the professional people like yourself that were around at that time were saying all prices were going to go down to five bucks. And of course, everybody being so negative meant prices were going to go exactly the opposite way. And we actually saw a great big bull run for all prices. So if you go back to my little quiz at the beginning of this talk, no one thinks prices are going any lower. I kind of wish y'all were thinking prices were going to go lower because that would be the, finally the time that prices were headed higher. So you, you kind of, you know, maybe uh, gave me a very depressive uh, indicator if the survey at the beginning of the talk was uh, of any consequence. I also like to show this graph because it goes back you know, well into history, 1965, it's just a few years after I was born, but I was kind of a late starter, so it's probably close enough to cover most of my uh, uh, career, definitely. And the purpose of showing this is that, you know, it's just a highlight. We might actually might be in uh, kind of a, a, a situation where the actual game is changing. If you look at the period, the last time we saw prices, and, and probably the curve to look at the most is uh, the $2015, so the darker line there at the top. The last time we had our price run up uh, was in the, in the 70s. And during that period, there was a very, very much a resource grab game being played on in the industry. And then as I mentioned, I came out of school in 85, so prices had already started to tumble quite a bit. They tumbled even further after I joined the industry. And you can see most of my career really was a very low price environment. And, and, and the game shifted to optimizing your resource base. You had a whole bunch of non-OPEC production come on stream in the late 70s in response to the higher oil prices, and that dampened prices for, for quite a long time. Until, like I just showed you, the Economist article came out in 1999, and that was kind of the bottom. Uh, so prices fell from 79 in, in, in constant dollars, in today's dollars, uh, all the way until 1998. Uh, so a very long period of declining uh, prices in today's dollars. And then just about the time everybody thought the prices were going to keep going down and could, would never come back up, well, sure enough, they went just the opposite way and prices went into a long bull run. And we had another period where the whole game was about resources and grabbing as many resources as you could. And we really didn't look at trying to optimize things. It was pretty much just do whatever it took to make sure that we were getting as much resources as we could because we felt prices were going to get higher and those going to bail us out. And so it was more kind of an opportunity constrained environment where you're doing anything you could to get resources. And so arguably, I'm not, I'm not showing the, the next phase, but, but, but definitely you could make the case that uh, it's very much possible that we shift it down to this game where optimization becomes a focus. And so the way you win in that game is uh, to focus on cost of supply and do everything you can to get the cost of supply as low as possible. And how long that lasts, you can tell I don't, I don't want to try to predict prices, but uh, there definitely is a scenario where it could be a very long time where we have low prices. And if that's the case, it's not necessarily negative. I, this just shows you the exact same graph. But it just highlights during that period when prices were quite low and we were into this optimization phase where the focus and, and, and the way you won in that, in that period was focusing on cost of supply and getting it low. If you look at the text box there, what I'm trying to highlight was the industry actually did quite well. The transition was tough. The 80s were quite hard and prices were really falling. But once they stabilized, even though prices were quite low, we just surprised the hell out of ourselves at just how much more efficient we could become, how much more productive we could become, how much more cost we could take out of our system. And throughout the 90s, which is a good bit of my career, prices, you know, from today's perspective, looked quite low. But it wasn't a bad career. It was a lot, we did a lot of fun and interesting stuff. It was just, it was just a transition period that happened. So I, I'm not predicting we're going into a long period of low oil prices. I probably am hinting that maybe that should be the basis of our planning so that we're conservative and we're ready just in case prices do stay low, low for a long time. So that might be a negative for some folks. But from a career standpoint, you can still have a great career even with low oil prices. And, and you notice as well in the text box that even the broad market did quite well during that period because 
you know, guess what? Uh, the economy does very, very well when energy supplies are quite cheap. So it's not like it's, it's just a, a, the overall economy does well and all the gas companies don't do well. We, we both prosper once we've got through the transition. So you guys know all the story because of the economics, but I like just showing the, the data because it really does show how big of a supply surge we had in the U.S. And it wasn't just the U.S. If you read the text box, you can see it. You know, it was also places like Brazil and Canada also had record uh, amounts of oil production. So the last time we saw prices go up in the 70s in a, in a big way, and that created a lot of non-OPEC supply, you know, say in Alaska and the North Sea. Uh, so in some respects, uh, this has some similar traits to uh, the 70s. We had prices go up, and you had a lot of non-OPEC uh, production group. But this time it wasn't Alaska and North Sea, this time it was an unconventional. And you can really see it with this graph. And that's just an amazing amount of all production. So this also, even though I can't predict where prices are going to be, this would be where we look at managing low all price warming that we have today. I think it is prudent to at least plan for prices to be low for a long time. And if anything, if you turn out to be wrong and prices get higher, well then that's just a nice pleasant surprise, which is a good place to be. And this is kind of a final slide of some of the macro stuff, stuff that you guys should already know, but it's just fun to look at. It's just, when you're my age and you realize that the U.S. in 2015 was the largest oil and gas producer in the world, it's just mind-blowing. You know, this, this panel and the previous panel really puts it into perspective just, just how transformative the market has been and, 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 and how, how much supply really has come almost, you know, from nowhere uh, in, the, in the last decade. Uh, so. Uh, the, the, the effects could be long-lasting, as I guess maybe the hint that I'm making, although I definitely don't think I can predict prior prices. So that's kind of the macro story. And then kind of my last theme was, you know, the first one was to be humble, the second one was to be cautious, the third one was be transformative. Don't waste this crisis. I showed you in the 90s, prices stayed low for a long, long time, but the industry has done very, very well. The transition period was kind of hard, but once prices settled down, even though they stayed low for a long time, we actually performed very, very well. The major oil and gas companies returned 16% per year, you know, for that decade of low oil prices. So don't be depressed if the outlook does turn out to be low prices are here to stay. You'll just be surprised what industry can do to kind of transform itself. And, and, and I'm kind of showing three legs of the stool. The real message is we've got a crisis. This is the perfect opportunity to be transformative. Look at everything that you can touch, both internally with our own business as well as externally how you're working with your suppliers. And so the last slide was just to kind of introduce to you that uh, in addition to the internal things, and there's a lot of internal opportunities to do things better, to do things more cost effectively, just to do business better, uh, where we're just uh, a lot more efficient. Also, when it comes to external, uh, just kind of a simple graphic to show that when you're really, really busy, when, when, when times are booming and you're scrambling to just kind of capture as many resources as you can, you really can't build the kind of relationships that this downturn uh, allow you to do. Now when the market's a little bit softer, you are able to be a little bit more organized, try to leverage your enterprise spend on a global basis to get better prices, try to bundle things when it makes sense to bundle things until you save on some of the interfaces, and also try to put performance contracts where you're trying to align your interest with your supplier's interest so you're putting longer term relationships. And of course, now's the time too to start thinking about longer term contracts as well, because if you do think uh, most of the deflation is behind us, and that there's actually prices are, are not going to fall as much going forward as they have in the last couple of years, it's time to start thinking about short term contracts. So we're spending a lot of time in Conica Phillips really pushing ourselves to make sure that we're being as creative as we can with our contract strategies to take advantage of this. Uh, low price environment. And the good news is right now, because activity levels are not near as hectic as they were two years ago, you actually have the suppliers willing to engage in those kind of conversations to see what kind of relationship could we structure that would be, uh, that would put us in a more uh, aligned position where when, when, when the jobs are performed well, they benefit and we also benefit. So that's what I have. And, and thank you for providing me some data on the price outlook with the survey at the beginning. We ought to do that survey at the end of this and see how many people change their mind. <laughs> the second speaker is uh, Randy A. Fouch, who is Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Laredo Petroleum Holdings Incorporated of Tulsa. He founded the company in 2006. Before starting up Laredo, he founded and later sold 
Colt Resources in 1996, Lariat Petroleum Incorporated in 2001, and Latigo Petroleum Incorporated in 2006. If you see a theme in those, in those um, uh, company names, it's because he's been uh, involved in team roping and rodeos uh, for almost all his life, so, and still is. Uh, Randy serves on, on numerous boards of, of uh, companies, educational uh, institutions, and, and service organizations, far too many for me to mention. Uh, he holds a Bachelor of Science in Geology from the University of Texas and a Master of Science in Petroleum Engineering from the University of Houston. Please welcome Randy A. Fouch. Thank you, Bob. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I told uh, David uh, I was going to do two things. One, I was going to thank him for setting the stage, and then two, I was going to chastise him for being such a youngster and only getting out of school in 1985. Some of us got a much earlier start. Uh, we take a, a little bit of a different view uh, toward, toward the whole thing, and I'm not particularly concerned about prices high, low, or indifferent. What we really are concerned about and focused on is margin, the difference between what we get and what it costs us to get. And I spent, you know, I got out of school in 76, so I spent a lot of my career with most with prices well under 35, 40 bucks, in some cases well under that. And through that period, the industry's made some pretty decent money over the years. Uh, it's the margin that matters. And right now today, in parts of the country, we have a very, very good margin. We don't need higher prices to continue to add supply to the United States oil supply. We can do it. So I have a little bit of a different focus. And part of my, the way I've governed my companies is to make sure that we focus on margin. I can't influence price very much. I do have a lot of influence on what our margin is. And so if you look at this, uh, at the companies that I have been CEO of, that I founded, this is my fifth time to see prices contract. Every time uh, margins contracted, every time they almost instantly rebalanced. And we're in, a, we're in a period now where parts of our industry, we've already seen a rebalance. So it's, you know, prices, not what drives me, what drives me is the ability to have a positive margin and keep that margin. Now, I had a little bit of a different view too in that I think the, with the ability to withstand low margins or withstand low prices until the margins change again takes a lot of planning, takes a lot of time, and it's something that has to be core to how you view this business every day, not just when prices start deteriorating, but it's something you have to do consciously every day. In fact, we're much more aggressive about protecting the downside when prices are running up than when prices are running down. We think you have to do this uh, uh, all the time. And we do a number of things. One of them is, our view is, if you have a contiguous acreage position and you get it held by production, you have tremendous optionality. Tremendous optionality. You don't have to drill to uh, preserve your acreage. And if you've got contiguous acreage, you can do some things with it others cannot do. We think it's easier to collect that early and use it to really improve your well economics, preserve that margin, make it happen. Uh, we think that operational excellency, we're, we're one of the lowest cost LOE operators in, in, in the Permian Basin, which is a really pretty competitive basin. We think that ability to really focus on best practices is greatly enhanced by having contiguous acres. If you're drilling wells 20 miles apart, it's hard to know what you did, what dial you tweaked, and what the impact was. We're drilling wells often within a quarter of a mile, half a mile of each other, and drilling a lot of them the way we set up. And so you really can do best practices. Same thing on, on uh, LOEs and, and the way we operate, at least operating expenses. Infrastructure is expensive. But somebody's going to have to put that infrastructure in, and somebody's going to make money on it. I just assume, do it ourselves, control the operations, and to a certain degree, us be the one that benefit not only operationally,
but financially from having that infrastructure in place. I mentioned that we're more aggressive about uh, hedging and things like that, and the price is on the way up. We pushed out all of our debt. The earliest debt we have is 2022 and 2023. We have uh, an un almost an undrawn revolver that's somewhere around $750, $800 million. Uh, that's pretty deliberate on our part. Prices were high, we saw the term, so we went out and made sure that if prices stayed down and the margins contracted, we were going to have a lot of time to adjust. By, by 2023, when our second tranche of debt stuff, we may see a totally new cycle. We may be here talking about it on the upside again. So we've been really aggressive, and this is par, this is how we've done it at all my companies. Here's the way we built our acre position. We went into this downturn with probably 70% of our acreage held by production. Now it's over 80%. It would be 100%. But we have some big ranches in which we have to drill a well every 90 days or six months to get it held by production. Every time we bought an acre, we had a spreadsheet where we said, okay, this is how much capital we have to spend to get this held by production before it gets to be a problem. And that's a lot of, a lot of companies are drilling wells today. They're not completing them. I suggest that's probably because they've got long-term rig contracts or they're having to drill to hold the acres by production. Data is interactive. You, you acquire a lot of data. You work it. You have the expertise to work it. If you, we were kind of the front leader in the Midland Basin. Uh, we drilled the first horizontal wells. Uh, if you're going to do that, you, you're often paying the price for collecting that data early. We think we can demonstrate dramatically how having that data and having worked it and had it steer our decisions has paid off and preserved our margins. Again, I can't protect price, but I can protect the margin. Here's an example, something we call the Earth model. If you looked at the, uh, just the electric log on the left, you would see that most people would land uh, that horizontal ladder in that zone that has the most green. Because of the data collection we've done and the way we've coalesced it, the way we've looked at it, we're choosing to land those laterals in other places sometimes that are not obvious just off electric logs and vertical well control. And you can see on the right, the green curve is our, the, the, the dash curve is what we expected in our EUR some time ago. The green curve is actually what we're getting based upon using what we call the Earth model. We're actually getting about a 30% step up in our completions and our productivity using the Earth model and enhanced completions. The data is paying off. The data are paying off big time. Uh, it matters. We think that, I can go back one. We think that striving to be the best every step of the way matters. And you can look at the, our, the way that we've improved our composite well, where we take the best piece of the best well and add those up and that becomes our target. And you can see that in, in 2013, uh, our average was around 45 days, our composite was, you can see it there. We beat that composite in 14. We beat that composite again in 15. So the attitude that even in a very good price environment, you need to make sure you get the most margin you can is, is cultural to the company. We also don't sign long-term contracts. Sometimes we pay a price for that. But we went into the downturn with no long-term contracts on drilling rigs, service companies. And we have a little different view of that than many others. The best practices are paying off for us. You can see that in drilling efficiency, we've had an 85% increase, uh, really in, in, a, in just a very few quarters. We keep that regardless of what service costs do, so that preserves, again, our margin. This is core to how we think about it. Uh, if you look at our lateral length, we've done that efficiency at the same time that we've increased our lateral length 45% increase. So it's tremendous efficiency gains we can do because we focus on best practices, we focus on our margin, and our acreage is set up to do that.
we, we have a thing called a corridor, production corridor. Again, our acreage is blocked up. So we're putting everything we can uh, in that corridor and drilling north and south from it. We use rigs that walk 25 feet and drill another well. Uh, from the time we finish a rig until we start another hole, until we finish a hole, start another hole, sometimes less than eight hours. We can do that, and we're doing it in such a way that, for example, about half of our crew never sees a truck. It goes through pipe, through our infrastructure, uh, to, a, to a crude oil transport. So we don't have to pay for trucking. We, don't, we never have any delays on letting oil set in the tank on that half of our crew. Same thing with our natural gas. Because we have the infrastructure, we can take our natural gas, wet natural gas, to something like 21 plants. Uh, again, that preserves our margin because if a plant has a problem, uh, we don't have to take our product there. So the corridors are very efficient on that. The big thing on the corridors is our water handling capability. Fracking horizontal wells takes a lot of water. We're recycling a lot of our water. A lot of the water we're recycling. It's produced water that we're reusing. And that's tremendous cost savings. Not only is it good in that you're not using fresh water, it's just cheaper to recycle that produced water. A lot of that goes into pipe. We built big ponds to store. But we don't have any trucks running up and down on that part of the water that we recycle. So we're not paying a dollar and a half, two bucks a barrel to uh, transport water. Again, preserving the margin. Operating costs, I mentioned this, hard to beat us. Uh, we knew two years ago, three years ago, we were going to be here. Uh, three years ago, we weren't recognized as having top of the class kind of operating costs because we were spending money on infrastructure, because we were spending money on data. We're going to be in this position for years to come. We've already spent that money. So taking that margin, investing in it early to preserve the margin long term is kind of cool to how we think about things. We've also felt like that since we can't predict price, we want to protect it that margin with hedges. We've always felt like you need to hedge enough to make sure you can always pay debt. If you can always pay debt, you survive. Uh, we always want to have enough to pay debt and pay our people, have some salary money. And we want to hedge enough to have some money left over for working capital. So we hedge aggressively. We've laid on hedges in the last couple of months. Uh, but going into this, we were protected with quality hedges. And in 15, we had, what you said, you know, an 80 plus dollar per barrel hedge. We didn't really mind the price. We were having great margins. We protected our margins. Same thing with 16. And we're also pretty well hedged in 17. So, in some of 18. So, the ability to hedge preserves margin when there's a low price stress in the environment. I mentioned the short-term contracts. You can see what we did with our rig count. You know, we were able to, because we didn't have long-term contracts, we were able to drill quicker within cash flow than many of our other companies. And so that got us in a really good position, uh, you know, very quickly, really. We went from something like 10 horizontal rigs to three in a matter of six or seven months. Uh, controlling the ability to keep that margin and, and stay within cash flow. I mentioned this, none of our debts due anytime soon. We've got tremendous liquidity. That was done very, very consciously. We, we were kind of prepared for prices to stay up and have great margins, uh, but we knew that if there was ever a blip, we were gonna push out debt as far in the future as we could. And we did that, and it's worked out pretty well for us. So. Tremendous liquidity on a reserve baseline of credit. No debt due for five years. Uh, we're in pretty good shape. During what most people, Bob and David mentioned, pretty stressful environment, a couple of years of low prices, we actually grew about, you know, look at the number, 22% calculated growth rate, 27% the last couple of years of production growth. That's pretty good. We did that again because we've seen this before. We know it. We know how to protect ourselves in a low-price environment, a low-margin environment. I'm proud of that production growth. 
during two years of stress in the environment. So we think the way this works is you get a senior management team that's seen it before successfully, not just you know seen it, but guys who actually managed through it. Uh, get your acreage put together, have really good rock on the acreage. Uh, make sure that you can be very, very efficient on your operations. Make sure you get the right data when times are good. Utilize that data. And then make sure that you don't, if, if none of your debts do anytime soon, it's, you know, you're safe. Uh, you know, you're, you're in really good shape. So make sure you're hedged up. Uh, certainly the prices are high. That's when you should hedge more. Uh, and make sure you don't need that dude. So with that, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Randy. Bill Lawson is Vice President, Corporate Development and Execution of Williams Company. Before assuming that role in 2012, Lawson worked for 18 years at Williams and Rolls, some executive level in finance, planning and analysis, and business development. Before joining the energy industry, he worked for electronic data systems. Bill has an undergraduate degree from Southern Methodist University and an MBA from the University of Texas at Austin. Please welcome Bill Lawson. very much. Appreciate that, Bob. And I think it's been a nice setup by my colleagues uh, up here today because they've described sort of the environment around the energy space and the importance of margins. And so it's appropriate for the infrastructure guy to get up here and say, you know, that's our job, to help supplies find the best markets and to help end users have the best access to supplies. So what I'll do is I think I'll articulate a little bit about the Williams strategy and how we fit into the natural gas space, because we are really a principally natural gas focused entity out there. And how we're well advantaged to take it, you know, to pursue and capitalize on the growing demand for natural gas. And along the way, I'm gonna share little tidbits about how we're navigating the difficult times in the commodity price environment. It has an impact across the value chain. Uh, but before we get started, I have a few slides that are courtesy of our legal department. They want to make sure that you're aware that there are some forward-looking statements that will be made. I think this is the end of the uh, legal department's slides. So as we move, move forward, and just looking briefly at Williams strategy, like Lovell said, everyone here. So we're focused on the natural gas value chain, and we seek to generate uh, feeds from our activities across that value chain. We connect uh, supplies with end users. We work on you know, processing natural gas liquids, fractionating natural gas liquids, helping deliver those to the markets in the petrochemical community. We take natural gas all the way from the wellhead uh, to the burner tips of the Northeast and the Pacific Northwest and other locations around the country. And so we are very fortunate today to have uh, some infrastructure that is located in some terrific spots. We actually think we have you know, access to the best supplies in the natural gas space, and we're connected to the best markets uh, there as well. So we've been working hard over the past couple of years to also reduce volatility. As Randy and Dave have pointed out, you know, volatility is one of the, the tough parts of the energy space, and protecting margins is important. And so we have been shifting our commodity exposure over the last several years and, and capturing more fee-based revenues. And for the business model of an energy infrastructure company, that's very compatible with our investors. And so we've been working diligently to do that. There we go. So let me just bounce through our, our nexus of assets here real quickly. Uh, the first step is our Atlantic Gulf uh, business. And it spans from really South Texas right up to New York City. And you can see that it, you know, a cornerstone of our assets out in the Atlantic Gulf region is the Transco pipeline system. And this is just one of those systems that we've had for a long time uh, that is a fantastic uh, piece of infrastructure. It's 9,700 miles of pipe connecting the supplies in, in uh, Texas all the way to New York City. Uh, we can move about 11 BC at a day of natural gas. Uh, we also have a coal stream system which connects South Louisiana over to Florida. That can uh, move about 1.3 uh, 
PCF a day for power generation in Florida. And then we have a whole host of gas gathering and processing assets sprinkled in the Gulf of Mexico region. So we have onshore gathering systems, offshore gathering systems, we have processing plants, fractionators, we have deep water uh, uh, systems to collect gas and oil, and we also have some deep water platforms. So we have a nice collection of assets down there. Moving now to the Northeast, which has certainly been one of the most exciting basins in the United States. And our Northeast assets are very well positioned to capture growth and participate in the growth of the Marcellus and the Utica. If any of you have been following that, it's been a stunning uh, change over the last 10 years. And uh, our assets there are really focused on gathering gas, processing gas, and helping transport that gas to the marketplace. And we've got a big presence up in the northeast corner of Pennsylvania, our Susquehanna and Bradford County Pops, where we're collecting gas and moving it on, in that dry gas onto the marketplace. We've got a big a nexus of assets down the southwest part of the Marcellus, so the southwest PA, West Virginia, northern portion, and the southwest corner of Ohio, where we're uh, processing and gathering lots of gas there. And then we've got some uh, joint ventures in the eastern side of Ohio where we're collecting a lot of Utica gas. And so this has been an incredible base. And any of you, if you've been following Williams, you've known that we've sunk a lot of dollars up in the Northeast, billions over the last several years. And that investment today is yielding us an opportunity to touch about 38% of all the gas produced in that region, uh, which is quite an accomplishment considering we really didn't have much of a presence there uh, just less than 10 years ago. Uh, and when you think about it, you know, connecting those markets, there's still a need for more infrastructure. There's still more uh, gas that's sitting behind our system waiting on uh, opportunities to get to the marketplace. We have about 700 million a day that's ready to come online as infrastructure is put in place. And this is one of those important themes that we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about a little bit more as we go down the road here, getting infrastructure in place so we can allow uh, the producing community to access those marketplaces. Here's just a little snapshot on some of the growth, and this is courtesy of Wood McKenzie, and they're just basically showing growth in production coming out of the United States and where most of that growth will be sourced for natural gas. And they estimate that 80% 80, 80 of it will come out of the Northeast. That's 25 BCF a day of new growth coming out of the Northeast. That's a stunning uh, change in the world. Okay, here's just a snapshot of our Western assets. We have a terrific position in the Rockies. Uh, we've got gas processing plants. We process about 4.3 BCF a day of gas. We move about 190,000 barrels of NGLs to the marketplace. Got positions all up and down the Rockies from San Juan all the way up to uh, Wyoming. But we also have a nice uh, transmission system, our Northwest Pipe System, that takes gas out of the Rockies and, and feeds it into the Pacific Northwest. This is an area that uh, has very attractive rocks, but uh, for now, it looks like there's more activity towards the Northeast because there's just some uh, tremendous plays that are being developed over there. So this is poised for growth as, as it gets appropriate price signals. And then last, we have a, a, a nice position in the central U.S., our central operating area, with a strong presence in the prolific regions of Oklahoma and Texas. And Williams has leadership positions in the, in the gathering and processing side in the Barnett, the Eagleford, the Haynesville, Permian, and uh, as well as the Mid-Continent. So we have nice positions there, and we continue to develop and expand our presence. About 5,000 miles of gathering pipes in the region, about 4.3 collecting about 4.3 BCF a day. So when you bring all of that together and match our assets where natural gas is growing, you can see that our assets match up pretty well with supply and demand. Just looking along that trans, Transco corridor in the northeast position, you can see where roughly 25 BCF a day of potential gas uh, supplies could be coming online line, and how that can move right across the Transco system to where demand is being developed, whether that's demand in the Northeast, demand in the Southeast, or even potential export demand down uh, along the Gulf Coast. So, let's take a look at the current environment. You know, in many ways, this environment resembles the classic Charles Dickens tale, of a tale of two cities, right? It's the best of times, it's the worst of times. And for many of those in our producing community, it's been a rough couple of years because margins have compressed. And then on the other end of the coin, you've seen the end users 
see opportunities. And the feedstock costs come down, there's a good opportunity for them to invest, to capture and participate in the growth of supplies. And so, as an infrastructure provider, we're trying to connect those. We're trying to bring those two markets together so that we can find the appropriate equilibrium uh, for these resources. You know, just a couple of fast facts, and I know Dave and others have shared this with you, but, you know, if you look at oil production in the United States, uh, you know, in 1970, it was 10 million barrels a day. In, in 2008, it was under 4 million barrels a day. Last year, it was 9.4 million barrels a day. So there's been an amazing change in, in our capabilities to produce and bring hydrocarbons to the marketplace. And natural gas has followed that same sort of narrative as well. Here's just a chart showing the supply growth of natural gas. And as Randy pointed out, it's about margins, right? So you've seen supply growth, and then the, the other lines coming down is just the price of natural gas. And yet, supply continues to grow because people have access to really good rocks and they're really smart and disciplined about how they spend their dollars and control their costs. And it's still encouraging development of these resources. And we turn to this slide. There we go. This just shows the margin compression that the industry is facing and has faced for the past couple of years. And that's tough, right? You've got to be efficient with how you spend your money. You've got to pick the best places to develop those resources, and you need to have access to the best marketplaces. So, in the business that we've all uh, been participating in here for a long time, there's an old adage. The cure for low prices is low prices. Now, intuitively, you'd think that sometimes when you have low prices, supply would start to constrict. But in the energy industry, that often is a price signal for others to invest in consumption. In gas, it could be a move towards more power generation, which is certainly what we've seen. Or it could be a move towards exports. Um, and so that's what we're seeing today, is trying to you know, put together that infrastructure to help take those excess supplies and put them to better work in the marketplace. Uh, now, to do that, the midstream industry really needs to step up and provide that critical infrastructure so that uh, producers, and end users can get matched up more efficiently. Here's just a little picture that shows that there is relief forecasted to come on the horizon. This is courtesy of Woodmac as well. And this is a snapshot along our Transco corridor, or so our Atlantic Gulf assets. And what you can see is that there's basically, they anticipate about 25 to 30 BC of the day of new demand coming on between now and 25. And where's that coming from? It's coming from the industrial sector using more NGLs and natural gas to make, to make products. It's coming from the power sector. It's coming from LNG exports around the world, clean burning natural gas. And it's coming from uh, exports to Mexico. So there's a lot of, a lot of demand coming online. And what we need is infrastructure to help make that happen. Now, when I look at you know, where we are today, this has been a tough environment. It's a tough environment for infrastructure companies. It's a tough environment for um, producers and even end users because you're waiting on waiting on supplies to hit you. Uh, so what do you need? You need cost controls. From a Williams perspective, you might have heard, you know, uh, Alan Armstrong spoke at uh, the Barclays conference here recently, and he noted that we've run out $55 million out of our cost structure if you're just looking at Q2 2015 to Q2 2016. So that's you know, a nice uh, reduction in some of our costs. We've done that by right sizing the organization a little bit, but we've done a lot of that through uh, trying to improve the way we manage our supply chain, to be smarter about the way we buy things, to be smarter about the way we spend money. And we've had a, a significant focus on those reoccurring spends that yield run rate savings, not just one time hits. So we want to get it on a continuous basis. And we've been working you know, with our teams for better vendor management, better category management, and trying to leverage those capabilities across the entire organization. And we've got lots of different operating areas, trying to leverage those capabilities across the organization to get scale pricing, to reduce complexity in your contracts. And we've established centralized strategic relationships with those high priority vendors so that we can have standardized terms and conditions, 
we can leverage cross-functional purchasing opportunities and get scale pricing in terms. Now, one trick here is you gotta get compliance. You know, you have a lot of buyers out there and there's always that, you know, urge to do something fast, to get it done quickly. Uh, you've gotta have some discipline in, in the process to enforce uh, folks using those contracts, using those standardized agreements. And that's an, an area where we've been concentrating and trying to make sure that we have appropriate buy-in. And we've been doing that by trying to make it more visible, our best practices, and we're trying to give, you know, uh, our leaders and decision makers better clarity on how much savings can be achieved by following some of these uh, opportunities in, in these contracts being negotiated. Now, another element in this whole equation is getting infrastructure in place. As many of you have noticed uh, out there, it can be hard to get big infrastructure put in, in place. There's a lot of permits, there's a lot of regulatory um, checks that you need to have marked. And the industry as a whole is perfectly fine with uh, abiding by those and working to achieve those objectives. The challenge we've been, we've had, is permits get delayed. They get put on hold, regulatory reforms come in and the goalposts keep moving. So it makes, this, makes it hard for us to install that infrastructure. And what that does across the value chain is it may delay development of an area where producers produce and they drill and, and develop those wells, but they can't get into the market. So the capital is deployed there. We might go out and buy all the necessary equipment, the pipes, the pumps, all those things, and have that city waiting for the appropriate permits to come in place because while it's being sort of wrestled out there in the regulatory environment. Uh, and then end users also may be investing in consumption and waiting for those supplies to hit market. So, you know, if we can streamline and better synchronize that process across the value chain, then we can help everyone achieve better savings and better economies of scale. So, in summary, I think it's, it's really simple. Be vigilant, keep trying to drive down costs, and you've heard that theme repeatedly over this discussion. And, uh, you know, infrastructure is important, and we're trying to find more ways to connect demand with supplies. You always need to operate safely and reliably, and you need to build trust with your stakeholders. Uh, and that trust is built through responsible actions. So, with that, I want to thank you for your time. Look forward to your questions. We'll start off with a, with a few questions from up here. First, I'd like to invite anybody in the, any of the presenters, if you have questions for one another, anybody want to ask a question about something you've heard? All right, you're, you're, you're off these. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, start with one with, with, with David. Uh, a, a key theme in your presentation was about managing external relationships. Uh, we're in uh, an era now where we have all this prompt, promptly available supply from, um, from shale production, uh, supply that can come on as quickly as somebody can drill and frack a well. Sometimes it's just frack a well in the case of real and uncompleted wells. Uh, so there's going to be tremendous, uh, a, a new tremendous element of competition in the oil field uh, because of that newly available, uh, promptly available uh, supply. How will that uh, complicate uh, management of external relationships. Is this working? Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah? Great. Uh, it's a good question. You know, for us, we're a little different uh, in the fact that we're still very big globally. So you do have some benefit where if we're, if we're talking about large suppliers, uh, we may be able to keep an ongoing relationship even though we'll see some flexibility within unconventional shells. So, so in some respects, that gives us an advantage being kind of global in scale. But uh, one that's a little bit harder to manage is, the, you know, we, uh, from an opportunity set standpoint, the unconventionals have just you know, totally changed our, our portfolio mix in a very, very short period of time to the point that uh, some of the more marginal type, type opportunities, uh, we really are going to make hard decisions from a capital allocation standpoint. In the old days, when you're opportunity constrained, you kind of spent money on everything you had. Now we're being more focused on our 
uh, capital allocation decisions. So we announced not that long ago that we're exiting from deep water. Really, that decision was because uh, we can see ways to maintain our production now without having to do these really expensive, high risk, long payout duration type projects like, like, like we have in deep water, which in a high price environment, those were very attractive opportunities. But when we compare that to the unconventionals and the fact that you can you know, quickly ramp up activity, get production on quite, quite quickly, get payout quite quickly. And so there we're exiting kind of a, a whole category of investment and to the degree that we were dealing with suppliers that were uh, focused on our deep water uh, business and focused on kind of our outlook for doing a lot more deep water going forward. In those cases, we just, you know, uh, they understand that the environment we and we have to, uh, I would say, more pick, pick winners in a, in a more focused way. So, so those things fall out. But, but then again, even even in that area, most of those suppliers are pretty big suppliers, so we're still doing business with them also. So we may not be using GE from a subsea standpoint and deep water as much going forward, but GE is eager to get into the onshore business. And so it does help us to kind of use the benefit of a, of a big global portfolio to mitigate some of that and make sure that we are able to keep some long-term relationships that will uh, provide value for us. Does that make sense? Yeah. Randy, uh, you, you uh, hinted that you, you maintained this uh, uh, strict focus on margins through all the companies that you that you founded, but I suspect that strategy has evolved as you gained experience and learned and encountered different situations. I wonder if you could address uh, how that evolution has, has gone in your strategy. Okay. I, I think for us, the, the all four of the companies were you know, I was personally very motivated to have them succeed. Uh, I had a lot of my capital, personal capital tied up in In fact, at Cook Resources, I actually went home, had a wife with four young daughters at home, and I said, Gene, I want to buy this property from Bowl. Our house was paid for, but I want to refinance the house and put another couple hundred thousand dollars back into the company. Um, that's when I started hedging. And that was one of the emphasis for thinking about margins. Have that conversation with, you know, your spouse and four young kids at home. The margin of business, I mean, this whole business is nothing more than making sure that you have good margins and protect them. Uh, and you, you can't get there any other way, no matter how, you know, you can, you can find all the gas you want, but if you're not making a margin on it, to your point, it doesn't do you any good. Uh, and so, it's just core to how we think about it is that you you really do have to have a margin that's sustaining, that's high enough that it allows you to make a mistake every now and then. Uh, but margins are just that's all that's all there is. That's all we think about. Uh, thank you. That uh, that that goes to motivation, uh, Bill. I, what 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 motivated you to start the start the strategy focused on on the supply chain. How, how would another company decide to, 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 to go that way? Sure. Well, I think, you know, it goes back to a point that was made earlier about day. You know, let's not waste a good crisis. So the storm clouds were brewing in 2014, and we were in the process of integrating an acquisition we made, Axis uh, Midstream. And uh, we were looking at, you know, how different companies do buying, how can we consolidate, we were looking at how we install systems, and the two companies went about it very differently. And we thought to ourselves, gosh, there's got to be a better way. We're seeing margins start to compress here. Looks like there's going to be some tough times ahead for the industry. What can we do? So we, we sat down and we thought about, can we uh, standardize some of the systems more efficiently across uh, the organization? And can we put out a program, which we call our Enhanced Savings Program, to target greater supply chain savings as well. So it's a two-step process, looking to see where we could standardize and come up with sort of uniform solutions that might fit in all market, marketplaces more comfortably rather than coming up with specialized uh, responses to the market. And then taking that standardization and running it across our supply chain and working with our teams uh, to find better ways uh, to reduce costs. And that also took us through a grid you know, we looked at the different buying patterns of the different regions and what they were buying, and we matched that up with who they were buying their supplies and materials from. 
and, and then started to work from there to find you know, solutions that we could run across the organization and achieve some results. And so we're seeing some of the early results of those efforts now play out. Now, if any of you followed Williams here over the past several years, we, we were a little distracted in 2015 with some other events, but, uh, uh, but we're back on track. So Randy would like to follow up with comment. One, one thing that I think separates a little bit our view is that when we say protect margins, we have a little bit of a long-term view, and we often don't use the lowest cost provider. That's a little bit uh, separate. We want our service providers to do three things for us, and, and sometimes you have to have a little bit of a long-term view for those three things. The first thing is we're going to bring crew to us that's safe and well-trained, and they've actually gotten some sleep, you know, that, uh, that matters. The second thing is we want to have equipment that's pretty well maintained. It's, it's a horrible experience to get on location with a, a, a big frack and, and have something that shouldn't go down, go down, and no replacements out there. The third thing, which I think is a little bit different than most companies at our company, is we want to do business with service providers that can keep providing us new technology and new equipment. The, the size of the fracks we're building now, if you had committed to a pressure pumping company two years ago, they would not be able to satisfy what we're doing. If you had owned a rig or signed a three-year contract two years ago, that rig, that drilling rig, wouldn't be able to do what we're doing today. Uh, we're retaining from 10, 12, 13,000 foot ladders and maybe going longer. Uh, that rig just would not have been capable of doing it. So when you talk about margins, you got to think about it in terms of more than 90 days at a time. That's a, that's a difficult thing for a public company like we are that gets ready every 90 days. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's open it up to the, to the floor and uh, take your questions. If you would, uh, either stand up and yell or come over here and grab the, grab the microphone. Identify yourself. Please. Yeah, I'll do both. Uh, Robert Kleinberg, Slumberjay. Um, it seems that the uh, uh, Mexican oil and gas governance is liberalizing. Uh, none of you have talked about anything international, but I was just wondering whether you had thought about um, operations in Mexico. Uh, and uh, if so, what are the sort of risks and opportunities there? And don't worry, I'm not going to ask the same thing about Venezuela. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll address that first, and I'll jump in. The other two guys may be much more interesting. When I started my own companies, I sat down and I wrote out a set of guiding principles. And in the top two, uh, one of them was that I don't ever want to have to do an EIS statement again, which means I'm on a private name, uh, mostly. The second one was no more international travel. And, and I defined one of our states as part of our 50 state union as being foreign, and I didn't want to go there. So we're not going to go there. I'd be happy to offer a couple of thoughts. You know, we, we look at our nexus of assets, uh, particularly the transco system and how that could be a natural extension. You know, if you saw uh, some of the slides I presented, Mexico presents a terrific opportunity for exports. Uh, and so we constantly monitor to see if there's opportunities for us to participate uh, uh, in that region. It's, it's tougher because the way they've set uh, up the bidding process is it's really kind of uh, a drive to the lowest cost of capital. And so uh, we're trying to, uh, if, if we look to go down and head that direction, uh, we'll try to be pretty strategic in picking those opportunities up. And then for us, we've been international for a long time. Uh, and we even looked at Mexico uh, back 10, 15 years ago. Currently, though, the issue ties back to what I was saying earlier that the, you know, the uncommitments really have kind of changed the whole portfolio mix. So it's going to be tough for, for new opportunities to compete in the near term with a lot of stuff that we already have in our, in our resource basket today. Uh, uh, I mentioned the decision to exit deep water. Uh, Mexico would, would, would have to also compete with uh, the rest of our resource base and it's uh, 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 so we, we uh, would it would have that hurdle to clear it would be a pretty high hurdle to clear I was thinking more of 
or Mexico online. Yeah. Online. Well, you know, back in the, uh, I guess it must have been the late 90s, 